Hello and welcome to The Failure of Humour, or The Humour of Failure, in The Dead Don't Die. My name is Oliver Rendell, I'm a PhD researcher from Manchester Metropolitan University, and it's a pleasure to bring you some of my research today. The form of humour made through ironic comments on oneself and the narrative one inhabits is by no means a new phenomenon. In fact, some of the oldest and most famous examples of humour in the literary canon adopt just such a self-aware attitude. We might think here of the incongruous asides Aristophanes directed towards ancient Greek audiences in such comedies as The Wasps, or Cervantes' Don Quixote and the chivalric romances it ridicules, even as it emulates them. However, while this self-referential or meta-humour has existed for as long as comedy with a capital C, in the postmodern era it enjoys a level of mainstream popularity unlike any seen before. Whether it's through an eye-rolling resistance to clichés in contemporary rom-coms, fourth wall breaking quips from Rick Sanchez and Fleabag, or the lampshading offered by Disney's endless stream of superheroes, self-referential humour can be found wherever a cultural form has found commercial success and consequently fights a losing battle with stagnation. For some critics, the popularity of this form is unsurprising. After all, according to Loredana Di Martino and the Encyclopedia of Humor Studies, irony is the central mode of consciousness of postmodernism and one of the main forms of expression of postmodernist literature. But what happens when irony, self-awareness and metacritique become cliches in their own right? In the neoliberal cultural machine, all popular forms of expression are inevitably exploited in the ceaseless pursuit of profit. Somewhat ironically, this process is extended to include the form of humour that explicitly foregrounds the exploitation of values, tropes and plot formulae. The purpose of this paper is to demonstrate that within this de neoliberal context, self-referential humour has itself become an overused cultural form whose self-reflexivity threatens its own function as a means of entertainment, innovation and critique. To demonstrate as such, I will be presenting the failure of self-awareness in Jim Jamush's The Dead Don't Die, a metafictional zombie comedy released in 2019, whose deadpan fatalism bespeaks the exhausted endpoint of postmodernism itself. Self-reflective humour is somewhat difficult to define, partly because of the many levels of self-awareness it can exhibit. This ambiguity indicates one possible reason why the concept is only discussed tangentially by most contemporary critics. For instance, Nicholas Holmes' Humour as Politics does acknowledge the use of self-aware humour in relation to a host of contemporary television programmes. However, his study focuses predominantly on the political paradigms of the texts it discusses, rather than the cultural materialist processes that self-aware humour embodies. Nevertheless, for the purpose of this paper, self-reflexive humour will be treated as a means of defamiliarising established cultural conventions by allowing characters to re-evaluate the internal logic of a given narrative using an external logic, namely that of the audience. The sudden appearance of this alternate frame of reference is incongruous and renders familiar aspects of contemporary culture unfamiliar, often ridiculous. Though this definition is inevitably too prescriptive, as most definitions within humor studies are, a rudimentary framework such as this enables me to clarify the cultural work enacted within Jarmusch's film. As far as overarching plot is concerned, the Dead Don't Die tells the story of two American policemen, Cliff and Ronnie, played by Bill Murray and Adam Driver, who died defending their rural town during a global zombie apocalypse. Throughout the film, the audience is introduced to other characters who reside or end up in the town of Centerville during the catastrophe, but the central narrative referred to in the closing monologue as the sad end of Cliff and Ronnie is undoubtedly the core of the feature. Jarmusch's film appeared well over a decade into what Xavier Aldana Reyes identifies as the post-millennial zombie boom, and The Dead Don't Die self-consciously embodies a, perhaps the, central hallmark of contemporary zombie narratives. 
the figure of the zombie has become the most pervasive horror icon for the early 21st century, Aldana Reyes explains, thanks to its metaphorical value, specifically, the zombie's ability to foreground pervasive anxieties about humanity's relationship to neoliberal capitalism, technology, and consumerism. As Roger Luckhurst puts it, the zombie is simply us reflected back, depersonalised, flatlined by the alienating tedium of modern existence. Jarmusch's contribution to the zombie craze likewise reflects this ongoing critique of real-life zombification. Indeed, humorous satirical potential is generated by having the zombies gravitate towards those things they valued or consumed in life. There is certainly something darkly incongruous about two undead stopping to chug coffee as they feast on their still-living waitresses, shown here, or a reanimated alcoholic endlessly repeating a demand for more Chardonnay. Even more surreally, the corpse of a young, fashionably dressed woman poses for a moment in the attitude of a model, as it shambles forward with the intent to consume. Though I haven't the time to fully explore how significant Jamush's permutation of the zombie is, suffice to say this overarching critique is by no means subtextual. In the monologue that closes the film, for instance, this, the disembodied voice of one of the few remaining characters, Hermit Bob, remarks that these people seem to have lost their goddamn souls, traded them away for, or sold them for gold or whatnot, listing such products as new trucks and kitchen appliances to keep his misanthropy in the realms of the sociopolitical rather than the spiritual. What I propose is unique about this film, however, is the way The Dead Don't Die uses self-referential humour to reflect upon the implicit call to resist zombification and, in doing so, problematizes the contemporary zombie narrative's extra-diegetic message. An attitude of self-referentiality is a natural fit for a zombie narrative in the 21st century, what with there being plenty of recognisable thematic and structural elements that contemporary audiences are by now over-familiar with. As such, when stock characters are introduced, they imply the setting up of typical zombie film conventions. We expect the media-savvy children in the juvenile detainment centre to play a significant part in saving Centerville, for instance, and that the racist Farmer Miller will either overcome his prejudices or face his comeuppance. We likewise expect quiet shop clerk Bobby to develop a romance with Zoe, the confident out-of-towner that shares his love of horror films and the film encourages such an expectation with an animated glint around the female character's head during their meeting. Such a cliched detail, a literalisation of the romantic spark, attributes narrative significance to this meeting, even as Bobby's encyclopedic knowledge of horror culture further heightens the intertextual referentiality of the film. The fact that all these narrative arcs and expectations are then bluntly curtailed, however, emphasises the film's deadpan subversion of audience expectations and a conscious desire to reflect upon such generic conventions. The children flee Centerville entirely when the zombie horde closes in, as anyone would, we realise. Along the way they help nobody and their fates are left uncertain. Farmer Miller is given nothing resembling a character arc or death with any critical significance and his intolerance plays no role in his fate one way or the other. Bad people and good people die exactly the same, in the same anticlimactic way we discover. And poor Bobby never sees Zoe again, both die soon after with little to no ceremony. Indeed, Zoe's off-screen death is later belittled by Ronnie's incongruous joviality, as he beheads her corpse and cheerfully explains the zombie film's logic of destroying dead bodies before they reanimate. Such examples demonstrate a self-awareness regarding the themes and narrative tropes that reoccur across zombie narratives. However, humour in such moments is either incidental physical comedy or slightly surreal incongruity generated by the unexpected truncation of generic conventions. For instance, when Cliff and Ronnie discover two mutilated waitresses in the local diner, Ronnie's immediate conviction that zombies were responsible curtails the process of discovery and disbelief that feature in most traditional zombie narratives. 
human results, because Ronnie's incongruous assumption is, in fact, correct, and aligns his perspective unexpectedly with that of the audience. To emphasise this, Cliff's disbelief in Ronnie's prediction stands in for the attitude of scepticism we expect to see in such diegetic situations, even as we now identify with Ronnie's point of view. There is, of course, a good reason why Ronnie's assumption is on point, and by returning to the sad tale of Cliff and Ronnie, we see self-awareness used to problematise the cultural work embodied in the aspects of the film laid out above. The revelation that recontextualizes the entirety of The Dead Don't Die appears at the lowest emotional point of the film. Trapped in their squad car, surrounded by zombies, Cliff asks Ronnie how he's kept so calm despite his pessimistic, often repeated conviction that this is all going to end badly. Ronnie's reply, shown here, is that he's read the script, the whole script, and has known from the start how everything was going to play out. Cliff, by comparison, was only given the scenes in which he talks to Ronnie and is angry at the director, his ostensive friend, for betraying him. What a dick, he says, a pathetic and incongruously understated expression of outrage. Here, humour is created by the unexpectedness of Ronnie's explanation, Cliff's underreaction to finding out the director effectively set him up to die, not to mention the sudden introduction of a metafictional perspective that makes sense of these characters' differing attitudes throughout the film. With the fourth wall broken, the audience suddenly understands why Cliff, the world-weary older cop, has slowly been unravelling throughout the film, while his younger partner, who we are led to presume would be more hysterical, remains level-headed and chipper. While both knew that they were in a film, only one knew its end point and that nothing would make a difference. It also becomes clear why Ronnie referred to Sturgill Simpson's The Dead Don't Die as the theme song in an early scene, and why, upon seeing the mangled waitresses, he was certain that zombies were responsible. More significantly, though, we realise that Ronnie has been aware of the town's horrible, predestined fate from the outset. Metafictional self-awareness was not enough to save anyone, it seems, nor could it offer Ronnie a way to change the formula that now demands his and his friends' deaths. Further emphasising this sense of entrapment, Cliff's reaction to his newfound self-awareness is the same as Ronnie's. Soon, he likewise adopts an exhausted resignation to his fate, as is shown in the scene provided. About as far from Camus' Sisyphus as possible, Cliff and Ronnie take no pleasure in committing to their futile task. They simply step out of the car, kill a few last zombies, and die in agony. There are no more jokes to be made, there is no escaping the formula, and there is nothing funny or poetic about recognising how inescapable one's situation is. Cliff and Ronnie's last stand turns out to be meaningless in the face of an endless consumerist horde, and their sad tale ends with a dispassionate giving in, as their efforts are swallowed by lifeless masses. A bleaker indictment of neoliberalism would be difficult to find. In fact, the mixed reactions this film garnered could be attributed to how unfunny the satire is in this self-proclaimed horror comedy. Driver and Murray's deadpan delivery, and Cliff and Ronnie's rapid acceptance of surreal experiences, effectively undermines any humorous potential in the film by making incongruous elements of the plot seem normal, thus robbing them of tonal or epistemological inappropriateness. Like Cliff and Ronnie, this film's best shot, its self-aware resistance to cultural zombification, is ultimately a failure. The only way to reflect on humorous self-reflection is to not be funny, and to not be funny is damning in a film that aspires to humour. With 21st century culture fetishising nostalgia through endless sequels and reboots, self-referential humour has never had more material to work with, is more popular than ever before, and has never been less innovative as a result. Is self-aware humour an Ouroboros, slowly eating its own tail in an endless cycle of exploitation? Can the forthcoming Scream reboot, itself a hyper-postmodern resurrection of 1970s horror cinema, 
provides anything other than diminishing returns on its original premise of genre awareness. The dead don't die, at least forecasts the worst. As Kelly Gardner explains, the past decade has seen the increased emergence of zombie narratives, wherein the zombie, having regained its sentience, is positioned in the role of protagonist narrator. I would suggest The Dead Don't Die takes this movement one step further by making explicit the contemporary zombie's anti-capitalist metaphor and demonstrating the futility of such a critique. The zombies that kill Cliff and Ronnie are easily recognisable as the dead-eyed drones of neoliberal capitalism. But, if you'll excuse the pun, the truly biting satire arises when we realise that Cliff, Ronnie and any other self-aware neoliberal subject are doomed to become similar, lifeless consumers. Aldana Reyes calls the zombie an image of what we might still become, should we persevere in mindlessly shuffling onwards, unwilling to come to terms with the horrors of the present. In the face of such a warning, Jamush's film shrugs and assures us that coming to terms with this particular situation won't help us escape from it. Self-aware humour has brought nothing more than tired resignation to the would-be heroes of Centerville, and it is unsurprising to hear the film end not with a punchline or a self-reflective quip, but with Hermit Bob's bitter proclamation that this truly is a fucked up world. As Umberto Eco has theorised, humour does not promise us liberation, on the contrary, it warns us about the impossibility of global liberation, reminding us of the presence of a law that we no longer have a reason to obey. Though Eco claims the potential to negotiate new ways of being within this rule of law, the dead don't die denies us even that. Exhausted, creatively and critically, this tragicomic embodiment of postmodernism itself limps towards its inevitable conclusion, just waiting to be put to rest. Thank you all for listening and I look forward to hearing your thoughts.